Adrian Alatoy, Alate, MA, is an end of life doula and founder of You Are Not Alone. She is also our IT and social media chair. And Donna Fahey, MSN, MFA, CNL, CHPN, A and B, and director of Samaritan's Institute for Education, Research and Innovation, and our chair of the Planning and Education Committee. So I'd like to turn it over to Donna and Adrian. Undo myself. Donna? Thank you for that so much. Uh, Tacey, that was great. I'm gonna start off with a video. There was once a time where it was just the person who had the advanced stage illness and myself in the room. I had told the family members to go lay down and get a good night's sleep so that way they can be well rested in the morning. So I found myself in the room thinking that I would just sit and maybe hold her hand and maybe play some slow music. I just felt as if the moment was telling me to get up, put on these really jazzy type songs and to get up and dance. That's what I did. I listened to the moment I got up and I danced with the person who was in the act of dying phase. I danced around her bed. As I danced, her pulse continued to increase. just knew that I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. Society would say, why are you dancing in the middle of the night? When I know that things are supposed to happen, I don't question them. I just go along with what that moment calls for. So to... This evening, Donna and I are going to talk to you about hospice and the life through Susan, through Susan's story. We're going to look at uh, Susan's decline. We're gonna look at the shock phase when someone first receives a terminal diagnosis, the stabilization phase, the active dying phase, and the postmortem care phase. The decline. I'm telling you this story, um, it, is, it is a real life. It's a client that I have um, worked with right prior to COVID. In this particular case, the client was lucky. She had a lot of resources at her disposal. She had a geriatric care manager, which is an individual who the family or a person may hire to be able to walk alongside a person um, who has a decline who may um, just need some additional support. Maybe the family is working, they can't attend their doctor appointments or just maybe some help with bill paying. You know, they're just a outside care manager that oversees a person's care, no matter where they find themselves in the hospital, outside of the hospital in assisted living. Maybe they need to bring in um, a healthcare agency. So in this particular case, we have Susan, who's an 87 year old woman. Susan is married with five adult children all of whom live close by except for one son who lives in California. She and her husband have been married for well over 50 years and have a great relationship. Her husband, age 90, is in overall good health. Her adult children adore their parents, but there is way too much conflict among themselves. There are no formal advanced care planning documents that can be located. Susan's daughter, the only girl of the five children, has been providing the primary care and decision-making for her mom. But guess what? The brothers question and complain about every decision that their sister makes. Although Susan's husband is unhappy that his children just simply don't get along, he makes no real attempt to settle the conflict. Susan's wish is that the family can come together in her illness. The brother who lives in California pays for all aspects of his mom's care that isn't covered by insurance. Susan was diagnosed at this point with Parkinson's 10 years ago. 
So two years into her Parkinson's diagnosis, her daughter felt that she needed to have a surrogate to attend the doctor visits. So she went to an organization called Alpha Aging Care Life Association, where she hired a geriatric care manager. Um, at this particular time, she was working full time and found that it was very difficult to attend her mom's doctor appointments. Susan nor her hu husband were able to actively share what happened at the doctor's appointment when they returned. So again, they put a geriatric care manager in place to be able to report back to them what happened at their doctor's appointments. We're going into the shock phase. In the shock phase, people have just lost, you know, complete control. So my recommendation to people in the, when you're working with people in the shock phase is to give them as much control as possible, even over small items in their life, give them choices and give them some control to, to bring back some sense of normalcy. So over um, the illness, Susan's uh, Parkinson's symptoms got worse, as we know. And at this point, she's in the most advanced stage of Parkinson's. Her limbs are extremely stiff. She is immobile. She goes from her bed in the morning to the recliner, to the commode throughout the day and back to her bed at night. Susan is experiencing anxiety, depression, insomnia, and fatigue. She can no longer swallow nor speak. And as a result, she has a feeding tube, which has caused quite a few trips to the emergency room. There have also been other reasons for trips to the emergency. Susan's daughter decides that the home that she has been living in for years with her husband just simply isn't peaceful enough for her mom due to family conflict. And the son in California steps up again. He pays for a temporary condo residence for his mom and dad. Susan's daughter has since left her job at this point, but the care manager is kept as part of her mom's care team due to the complexity of the family issues, the disease, and at this point, Su uh, Susan's daughter is having some health concerns of her own. So you, we have the care manager who is overseeing the hospital stays and advocating for, and has since that decided to advocate for a palliative medicine um, consult. The PalMed team meets with Susan and documents her care goals and coordinates with the medical team for symptom management and a referral to hospice. After interviewing a couple of hospice organizations with the family, a hospice organization is identified. Donna, will you share a little bit about what's going on with the hospice organization at this point? Absolutely. So. Um, well, I'm going to start with just a differentiation between hospice and palliative care and, um, and also just a recon recognition of, of how healthcare is changing and um, hospice organizations becoming palliative care, having primary care, and then partnering with other organizations like geriatric care managers and their life doulas help us bridge those gaps. So we know when ho hospice patients come to us so late. And by partnering with these different organizations, we're able to get to our patients sooner and they don't fall through the cracks. So it's kind of a, a beautiful little um, you know, marriage between all of these disciplines working together for those patient goals. So the difference between palliative care and hospice. Um, so palliative care is really not eligibility criteria. It's really needs-based. You do have to have a serious illness, a serious life-threatening illness. You can't, if, even though you have anxiety, you can't get palliative care. You have to have a, a, a disease part of that too. But really what they're coming in, mostly in the acute care setting, is one to help with goals of care. So we all, if, if you're working in acute care, you know how um, all of our needs you know, play, play to the forefront. We think this is best for this patient. We think this is best for this patient, but palliative care really comes in and has that heart to heart talk with the patient and family to make sure that those goals are clear to the entire care team. Um, hospice is a little different. So hospice comes in when there's a, um, a progression of that disease that, that if it took its normal course, it would, that patient would die within six months. Um, so, and when that happens, they're able to elicit their hospice benefit. And a hospice benefit is paid for by Medicare and Medicaid and also uh, many, many um, private insurance companies. 
Um, and what that does is, is it allows that patient who most likely will want to stay home and out of the acute care setting and be able to kind of get the hospital, get the pharmacy, get the nurses, get the help in the home that they need. Um, the other thing about when a hospice referral is put forth is especially in the hospital, in the, in the acute care setting, there may be a hospice that's partnering with that hospital, like their preferred provider, but they need to give a family at least three different um, referrals. And this is important for all of us to know because not all hospices are the same. And there's a website called Hospice Compare, and it's like a report card of all different hospices. And because hospices generate on a quality, quality based program. So we're given a, um, a certain um, amount of money per patient, you know, we're not paid for services that we're giving. And so in order to do that, we're graded by our quality. So you can go onto this hospice compare website and you can put in a certain location and get all the hospices in a certain area and you can see them up against each other for profit, nonprofit. Do they have complementary um, therapies? Do they, you know, how, how what's their uh, ratio of volunteers to, to paid employees? So these are great things that you can offer your patients in terms of that beginning of, of, of selecting hospice and really kind of having those conversations. Thanks, Adrian. So in this particular case, um, the end of life doula has not stepped into um, the care, part of the care team. But there are times because we are bringing such awareness to end of life doulas and that people will reach out to a doula before they reach out to hospice. So a doula sometimes has to um, educate the family on hospice and encourage them to make the call or have the conversation with the doctors. One of the things that I do as a doula is I um, tell them to really be curious and open to all the services that hospice offers. Um, for example, um, physical therapy, um, you know, volunteer services, um, the young lady said, which is very important, um, you know, due to use of volunteers, sometimes you can bring in aromatherapy, you can bring in um, energy healing, Reiki, you can, um, you know, have a massage service, a person, you know, there, there's so many different modalities that can come in, sometimes through hospice, um, unfortunately, sometimes those are, at this point, you can correct me, my wrong, Donna, mostly like volunteer positions, correct? Uh, it really depends on the hospice. So um, like, for example, Samaritan uses, we have Reiki, we also have um, aromatherapy that are by the practitioner. So nurses will bring that in and social workers will bring that in. And then we also have massage, pet therapy and um, music therapy, which is a practitioner in themselves. So we'll have music therapists and, um, you know, the pet therapist. So it's kind of both. And most hospices will have a little bit of both ones that they train their clinicians to bring in and one that they hire uh, a discipline specific to bring them. Yeah, that, that's really great to hear. So in, in this particular point, uh, the hospice stabilizes Susan's physical care. The care manager realizes that the arguments between the adult children are increasing and affecting Susan's well-being. Susan is becoming fearful of her life coming to an end and her husband, and some of her children appear to be in denial. After hiring a home health care agency to complement Susan's medical care um, that hospice is providing, the care, member, the care manager remembers a conversation on a Thursday night, <laughs> September the 8th. <laughs> That's tonight, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, they learned about what a doula is. And so they mentioned having an end-of-life doula to the family. And the daughter said, you know what? I remember a couple of years ago, we had an end-of-life doula who came in that helped our family and she really made a big difference. So she's in agreement. And although the brothers are hesitant, the one in California agrees to pay for the end-of-life doula services as he, like everyone else, really wants the best passing for his mom. And he really wanted to for all the siblings to, go, to come together. So he was sort of relying on a doula to help with that as well. And so what's going on now? I think I spelled the geriatric incorrectly. Am I right here? I'm looking at it. Okay, that's just- You're missing an eye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, so the manager is still monitoring Susan's care. Um, she realizes that the daughter is having some, some struggles with taking care of herself. So she shares some resources. Um, it, again, the practical matters, bill paying, household duties to minimize the family stress, worry, and workload. Whereas on the other end, the end of life doula, she first was really brought in. Again, they were questioning and there was so much conflict 
about what the daughter was doing. So she, her main focus there was to really to obtain and record because there were no advanced care directives that they could locate. What was Susan's beliefs and wishes as it relates to her end of life? Um, and again, just to minimize that sibling discord, to empower Susan with education choices and, a, and for her to have a voice in her end of life experience. And then to bring all the family members together so that they were very well aware of Susan's um, end of life wishes. Talk a little bit, a little bit more about what hospice is doing right now. Absolutely. And um, so when hospice begins, we're all about the patient and, and about those care, care goals and also anticipating what may happen in the future. And <clears throat> so this first part is we talk about how hospice stabilizes um, Susan's physical care. So there was symptoms that presented. She had, she was anxious. I think she had some pain. So those are dealt with first. And what happens often when hospice comes in, because we're focusing on what matters most and we're eliminating things that don't necessarily, there, there's more burden than there is benefit, that the patients actually get better. There's, there's this kind of like gift that happens. And this is what's happening with Susan. So we're collaborating with the family, with the, with the, um, the entire care team and, and with the geriatric care matter and with the end of life doula, just to kind of, let, let's make a plan. Let, let's put ourselves together, figure out what we need to do, what we can do for Susan and this family. And so that we're all on the same page and that becomes the plan of care for, for, for Susan's care. I guess, you know, the other thing I, was, I, I mentioned um, is the care kit. Sometimes um, this can be confusing to a lot of people. So I, I mentioned that hospice tries to anticipate and there's certain symptoms that many um, patients have near the end of life, shortness of breath, there could be pain, constipation, there could be a little bit of anxiety. So we have these little boxes and we call them uh, care kits. And um, I've had many questions where people have said, you know, all right, my loved one's not dying. She's on hospice. Why is there morphine in the house? You know, there's this big, you know, heavy weight on morphine. Well, we try to have medicines in this little box because um, guaranteed symptoms are going to manifest themselves at 2 a.m., you know, on a, on a Sunday, that's a holiday. And it's, and the CVS is going to be closed and we can't get the doctor to, to put a prescription into the pharmacy. So we want to be prepared. And so we have these little boxes in the home and we usually put them in the refrigerator. And why we put them in the refrigerator is because when we have that panicky phone call um, at 2 a.m. in the morning, we're able to direct that family very calmly. This is where you go. go open up the refrigerator, grab the little box, open it up. You're going to find this, you're going to find that. And we can walk them through that. So just wanted to add that. Thanks, Adrian. No, thank you, Donna. That's really important. Um, and so, again, we have hospice, we have the, the geriatric care manager and an end of life doula supporting this family. So at this point, Susan is starting to have some trouble breathing. The doctor calls hospice, a nurse comes to the home and they decide to increase her oxygen. The hospice team suggests discussing a plan for when symptoms return and what to do next. They also discuss what an emergency room visit might look like for a person who, who is on hospice. Um, and at this time, she, Susan does decide to move forward with um, putting a DNR in place. And so again, what does a hospital visit look like for a, a patient who is hospice and has a DNR? And so um, the hospital team takes the time to educate the care manager, who usually is the one who shows up and advocates um, for Susan during her acute hospitalizations. So again, um, the care manager makes weekly visits to the home. They're constantly being educated um, by the end of life doula on what to do in the different phases of death, how to show up and how to empower Susan and her family. And at this point, um, she's in the shock phase. So again, like I said, putting in as many um, decisions that she can make so she can feel like, you know, the floor was just swept from under her feet. Um, how can we put that, um, give her a little stabilization and that is through um, giving her a feeling of control. So again, um, there was no, uh, uh, there were no advanced care documents in place. And so what the doula did is, um, um, I, I told them, and what I do is when there are no documents and there's no time to bring in an attorney, um, go to your state website. They have 
um, the rest care documents on your state website and they don't have to be notarized. You just need two witnesses. And so that's a quick way to at least minimize some of the rumblings that is happening in this particular family. And so um, myself included, I also am including to know who's gonna make your decision and what decision you want if you can't make them for yourself. I also create what I call a living well plan. And so what that talks about is what does Susan want when she goes into the active dying phase? And so over a couple of visits, Susan and I removed ourselves, went to a private room just to make sure that there was no outside influence um, and created, um, you know, so a doula goes a little bit deeper than necessarily this living well plan um, that works really well, goes a little bit deeper than say the state uh, directors or even maybe what you may see in uh, that the work that an attorney does. And so I'm not putting down attorney because my, I, I myself, my advanced care directives are written, um, were done by an attorney. But um, so after all this was done, there was a meeting, but I just want to tell you a little bit more about Susan based on our, our conversations in the side room. So she definitely was in agreement that she wanted her daughter to make all healthcare decisions if she isn't able to make them. She wants to stay in that temporary resident at the time of death. Susan was very detailed. She, if she was not able to be transferred, she wanted her hospital bed to be moved to the living room because she really wanted her family and loved ones to be around her in the final moments. Susan is, um, so one of the questions I asked is, who do you want to wash you if you can't wash yourself? She, only, she was only comfortable with her daughter, hired caregivers, her husband, and just a couple other female family members to provide personal care. And she always wanted to be cared with kindness and joy and not sadness. Her greatest wish was to be comfortable by any means um, as it relates to what, um, you know, medically or alternative medicine. So Susan was okay with her pain being managed, um, even if it cost her, you know, sleeping more or being drowsy. She did not want to be in pain. Um, she wanted to have light touch. She wanted her hand to be held and she wanted her family members to speak to her even if she couldn't respond back. Um, she definitely, Susan uh, uh, definitely wanted to maintain her dignity. No matter what, she wanted to be clean, dressed in a pretty dress, moisturized, and she wanted her fingernails polished. She did not want anyone to take a photo of her. And how many times are these, these are the type of conversations that are necessary. She did not want her, uh, anyone taking a photo of her once she went to the active dying phase. She just wanted her family around her telling stories and jokes, reading poems, you know, scriptures, praying. She wanted to be, them to be happy and she did not want them to be sad. Um, she talked about her love of music um, and it was decided that she wanted her stepson I'm sorry, not her stepson, her son-in-law, who she considered a son, um, to be the one to make the calls if her, if her other children, like the, the son from, from California, didn't make it. Um, so you want to talk a little bit more about your part there, the house's part, Donna? Absolutely. So um, so Susan's symptoms are, are progressing. So at this point, um, what what we would be doing it is is kind of talking about um, the trajectory of dying and supporting everything that's going on in terms of how um, um, the death doula is having this very very special relationship with the patient and it, and it, uh, this word came into my mind called anamkara and I don't know if a lot of people know what that is but anamkara is called soul friend and it's really this partner with the patient that kind of coaches them through death. So the end of life doula in this in this situation is providing um, really fantastic information that is informing the care team. So the hospice nurse is coming in and um, really talking to Susan about if the breathing continues like this, what do you want to do? And um, this is usually there's pain and shortness of breath are probably the two first symptoms that manifest. So we start using PRN medications and we all usually use PRN medications probably for the first 24 hours. So we can find that like perfect moment where symptoms are, are relieved to whatever degree that Susan wants them to. And, and the effects of them, the sleepiness or whatever that is, is, the, is minimized. So once we can find that, we start with a round the clock medication. 
And the, the benefit between an around the clock medication and a PRN is that PRNs tend to hit us strong and then wear out. Whereas around the clock is this nice little steady stream that keeps us right in having that subdued that pain and subdued that shortness of breath. So the nurse is working on those things and the social worker and the spiritual chaplain are really complementing what's happening with the care manager and also the end of life doula really in supporting them and kind of bringing those wishes to the forefront. One thing that's important that um, some people don't know is that a patient can revoke hospice. They can come on and off hospice as many times as they want, and they can come back to that hospice and we're going to have open arms. It's all about the patient's goals. And sometimes we can, you know, especially in those emergency rooms where a hospice patient is coming in, we can have our own ideas about what's going on. And, and it's really important to kind of take those ideas out and figure out how we can support and whatever those decisions are that's, that's happening with that patient and family. All right, thank you. So now we're gonna look at the stabilization phase. This is a really fun and enjoyable stage as far as I'm concerned. You know, the patient becomes stabilized, they're out of the shock phase. This is where you get like some of the fun work done, like maybe creating remembrances, working on legacy projects. Um, you know, I sometimes encourage my clients to give away the things, you know, don't wait to that end of life, that last breath for people to receive what you want them to have. And so there's so much fun that you can have during the stabilization phase. So with the case manager support, all the team members, again, Susan's very lucky to have these, uh, you know, the, you know, resources in place. Um, so all the care team members collaborate more closely, sharing talents and knowledge with each other. They all begin to visit more frequently and at times share a visit. The hospice team appreciates the doula's perspective and share the doula reports at the IDT meetings. The home health care agency recognizes and utilizes the technique that they observed the doula using and requested additional support from the doula. So again, it's everybody coming together, supporting each other while supporting Susan. Um, the doula extends um, an invitation for all to meet at the house and to perform what I call a dress rehearsal of Susan's last moments and days on this earth. The team gets close, gets a clearer understanding of Susan once as a result. So we have the care manager here who is realizing it's a stabilization phase, realizing, you know, based off of the education from the doula. Um, and so she, uh, the care manager is also taking on like additional smaller tasks just to keep the family moving. Um, and again, less stress and less worry. Um, you know, maybe paying more of the bills and just taking on more of the tasks so that we could focus, the family could really focus in on Susan and her well being. Um, one of the things I think is really, really important, it sort of lightens the load, especially when there's a close tie, like Susan and her husband being married for 50 years, is to create a plan. What's going to happen to her husband after Susan takes her last breath? What about that 24 hours? What does it look like? Three days, seven days, one month? Sometimes I go out to three months. Like what is, once Susan has that information, she's able to breathe a little bit and know that her husband's going to be um, in a good place. She, she has an understanding of where he's gonna be. And then I discuss with the family, like, do you want any special rituals um, once she takes her last breath and before that body is taken away? And of course, we spend a lot of time on sibling harmony techniques. We practiced and we shared. And then we began to look at, um, you know, her memorial services. And so these are some of the recommendations that I made based off my conversations in the side room with Susan. We brought in essential oils. Um, if you only give but three, I, I suggest lemon, lavender, and peppermint. Lemon to uh, boost mood, lavender to calm, and peppermint when people have to pull an all-nighter or get, are starting to get tired, it will wake them right up. I also uh, suggested battery-operated candles, and, you know, as Susan is um, continuing along her disease process, you know, if she no longer needs medical equipment, let's get rid of it. There's no need to keep it in that in Susan's room. I also uh, suggested setting up a room where people can meet if they need to be sad, because you remember, if they're, if they're having no sad, she didn't want that. So we had a, a separate room where family could meet um, and go, or if they needed to meet with medical personnel, um, 
you know, they had a separate room. Um, also taking the time to identify online places and some books that the family members could, you know, it's easy for me to give you poems, but how about I give you a resource where you can go find the poems that work for you and your mom's relationship. You know, we talked about different Bibles, verses and songs and things like that, that, that could be shared in those fine, final moments. Um, we also worked on, well, what does, again, I shared a little bit, who's going to call who? So you want a completed list of beforehand, before the last moment happened. So that way, a week, a day or two later, you don't say, oh my goodness, we forgot to call someone. I also believe that um, if Susan is comfortable and if the family members is comfortable, give her as much say so as she can handle and the family can handle in her memorial ser service planning. So in this particular case, Susan was Catholic. Um, she wanted to go to a Catholic cemetery. Um, she even requested the head, uh, the head priest at her church for us to do as much as we possibly can to get him in. And so my recommendation was, you know, as we're talking about um, the funeral home and things along the line, let, let's invite them in. So that way they can also, you know, form a relationship with Susan and their family um, prior to that last breath. Um, so that way, and we were real adamant that we didn't want a sales pitch. We just wanted a visit. Um, we talked about whether, you know, what did Susan want as far as a social media policy? Um, and again, if she can, if she can, and if she's up to it, um, you know, I, I believe in offering people a chance to write the eulogy, creating their, their program for the, the event, and maybe even possibly picking out pictures for the program and, um, and for, you know, now everyone has these video slides going. Uh, and it was because Susan was so key on her family being around her, because that was so important. And we were, you know, at the beginning stages of COVID, I wasn't sure if they were going to be able to make it. So what we did was we placed um, pictures around her room and around the living room, depending on where she was. Now we know that it was important for everybody to be there. We know that there's family conflict. So what we did, our last resort was, well, I won't go to the last resort. We conducted <laughs> as a family codes of conduct. What are the codes of conduct when we visit, when we're in a home? No one had a problem with Susan. The siblings just had a problem with each other. Um, we brought in the social worker to have some conversations from hospice to also support their um, getting along. I shared a couple harmony techniques um, that I use with my clients and one being, you know, you have to find a commonality. So, so it's just when you, when you, when you see a person or you agree to a person that you're not getting along with, what in me shares something the same or have the same thing in common with you? So the greatness in me sees a greatness in you. The child of Susan and me sees a child of Susan and you. Sometimes it's just the human in me sees the human in you. The red blood in me sees the red blood in you, but there's always something in common and that will lessen the conflict. You know, just taking the time to give a heart to heart hug. When one heart touches another heart, you know, amazing things really do happen. I share with them how to tap to reduce their anxiety and fears. And then just taking the time before you maybe say something just, or if you're having a bad thought, just ask yourself, what am I telling myself? Is it even true? What's the evidence? Is, are these thoughts serving my family and the moment? And if it's at all possible, can I change my thoughts? And so, like I said, Susan did have, um, you know, she was really aware of how she brings in herself. And so some people will tell their family, you know, I don't, don't, you know, you know, how much you spend on a funeral doesn't mean how much you love me. Susan, on the other hand, said, I want flowers and flowers and lots of flowers. I want to go out in style. Um, so that was really interesting. Um, you want to share a little bit what's going on in the stabilization phase for you, Donna, in the hospice team? Absolutely. Um, one of the important things with, with hospice is this interdisciplinary team. And 
not only do, do each of the disciplines, as you can see, even the, the doula and the care manager and the, and the hospice is bringing in different expertise, but also the fact that we're leaning on each other. So um, end of life care can be very rewarding, but it can also, um, you know, take, take, take from you, um, especially this family who's, who's fighting with each other. And, you know, you, you go into these areas again and again, and you want, you want harmony, you want these good deaths, you want, you want all of this, you want to bring peace and solution to these situations. And when you get frustrated because you can't do that and you really shouldn't be doing that, we should be supporting, you got to lean, lean on your team. You have to support each other. Um, so much so. So the interdisciplinary team is so essential in end of life care. You, one person cannot do this job. Um, it, you ju it's just not in within you. It needs connections. It needs that, that, um, that give and take between people to, to really see that whole spectrum of, of, of end of life care. Um, so that's one of the cornerstones of hospice. And I think that's a cornerstone that's, that brings um, the strength to end of life care. Um, you have that holistic perspective, you know, the body, mind, and spirit. You have um, the medical piece, thinking about medicine and what's going on with the body and able to articulate that and educate that. Then you have the social worker, you know, coming in and helping with the, navigating um, those relationships. And, and you have the spiritual um, counselors or the chaplains that have that foot into um, religion and spirit, spirituality and also existential concerns. And you know, sometimes within our own framework, we may have an idea of what all this is. And when we ask questions such as Adrian was talking about, it's like, well, what rituals do you want to do? What really matters? What is it going to look like when you die? Sometimes you're really surprised by what, what answers you get. You know, we've got a huge diverse world out there with diverse beliefs and, and these rituals at end of life the most amazing things that you will see, but they may surprise you. So you've got to ask those questions and really be open to what that story is going to be for these patients. So thank you. So now we're, we're going into the active dying phase. So Su Susan enters the active dying phase on a Friday night. A care manager is not necessarily available, um, but there is a care plan that's in place based on the dress rehearsal and all, all that we have done up until this point. The doula received the call around eight o'clock and, and arrived within the hour. She sat visual with Susan and the family. The room was dimly lit with candles. The 1,000 place was right, right, so wide. And then- All right, that's what we got. I love the tech, I love technology. We wouldn't be able to do it without it. Um, the room was dim, dimly lit with candles, the essential oils. There was um, soft music coming from the doula's phone. Everyone was telling stories and laughed. The doula gave the daughter permission to get in the bed with her mom for part of the night. The doula stayed woke throughout the night with just one granddaughter who, who stayed awake. Everyone else eventually fell asleep. In the morning, the doula made breakfast for the family, cleaned the kitchen, and then she went home, well, prior to going home to get her own sleep and her self-care, she discussed again, went over that plan checklist. Um, when the doula arrived on Saturday night, Susan was still in the act of dying phase and she prompted the family members, listen, go get a good night's sleep. There's gonna be work to be done for tomorrow. If anything changes, I will definitely uh, wake you up. Um, and, um, you know, again, each, each visual is diff different, but in Susan's case, I did find myself dancing around the bed um for hours for hours through that second night and the funny thing about it was that we didn't necessarily have a playlist but we, you know we on these phones you can go back and you can see what music was played i shared the list with the daughter and most of the songs that i chose because of the moment were some of susan's favorite songs they could not believe it and so again, at this point, the, do, the doula is sitting vigil, you know, mostly due to night, allowing the family to rest. Um, there's also, uh, I like to mention the threshold choir in this particular case with, with COVID, she, she uh, you know, wasn't there, but there's a nonprofit threshold choir that will come out and, you know, sing 
at the bedside or sing virtually. Um, and so I just felt the need to do that, to, to, to share that because I, I take advantage of them. Even for myself, um, they sing to me. Um, so again, the, the care manager is staying um, on top of things by making phone calls, but it's the doula in the home with the family. Donna? So one of the things I think um, just to clarify active dying phase, sometimes that can be like a mystery, like, you know, when is active dying and when is it not? So in a very general, general sense, because everybody's different, obviously, that um, the active dying phase is, is roughly about three months before their death. And then there's this period of, um, you could call it imminence of death or the dying phase, which usually lasts about three days prior to the death. And um, hospice people and a lot of palliative care people talk in terms of months to uh, weeks, weeks to days, days to hours, hours to minutes. And what that kind of means, um, in, in an intellectual sense, because there's definitely an intuitional sense to it and a critical thinking sense. But in a logical sense, what we're doing is there's a list of symptoms that, um, or changes that happen near the end of life. And when we see these changes happening, let's say someone who is not bed bound becomes bed bound and, and then maybe they have a little shortness of breath. If those two things happen within a month, then we're looking at months to weeks. If we see an increase of pain and we see some constipation and now they're incontinent and we see those changes happening within a week, then we know it's weeks to days and so forth. So it's really when you see these symptoms popping up and how frequently they are, we tend to use those frames of days to weeks, minutes to hours, those, those types of things. Um, the other important thing that um, hospice is doing is, is educating about what I call non-distressing changes or symptoms and um, things that we expect are going to happen that may, they're not going to necessarily cause that patient any pain or any distress, um, but they're going to distress us and they're going to distress that family. Um, probably the worst one is what um, is, has an unfortunate name called um, terminal secretions or death rattle. Um, and really what that is, is at end of life, there's an increase of, there can be an increase of secretions. And because of everything else that's going on, there's a relaxation um, in, the, in the neck muscles and the vocal cords. And sometimes there can be just a little bit of spit. There could be just a little bit of fluid that gets stuck. And when that patient breathes in and out, it's, it's heard at, um, and, and it can be quite loud. So that can be a frightening thing to hear. Um, and, you know, suctioning doesn't really work. Sometimes we give drying medications, but then that has its own um, after effects as well. The best thing to do is just to turn the patient. Sometimes turning the patient to the left or the right side eases that, um, it puts the neck in a different way and those things are, are, are um, subsided. Um, other things that can be very um, scary to families is changing in breathing patterns. Um, and, and, and sometimes they look, they look because the body's moving in a different way. People think that the patient is in distress. So we talk about that we talk about, you know, as the patient, as the, um, body is, um, you know, shutting down the, the neurons don't necessarily click anymore. So the hippocampus is the one that really triggers our breathing. So it, 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 it responds to the CO2 levels that are going on in our body and says, okay, you need to start taking deeper breaths. But that, it's, there's no longer a communication. So we can see things called chain strokes um, breathing. And what that is, is there could be like rapid patterns followed by periods of apnea where there's no breathing. And then there's a gas. You know, so, or there could be just gasping, there could be guppy breathing. So different things like that, we need to be able to tell the family that, that this is okay. And this is, this is normal and it's not causing any distress. Obviously you have to look for different things. And the best thing is the, the forehead. So if a person is having these abnormal breasts and their forehead is pretty calm, then we can guarantee, you know, it's almost like they're, they're okay. They're, they're at peace. Um, so I put a list together, um, which I'll put in the chat. 
um, of different things, circulatory changes, uh, gastrointestinal changes that we can see, and simple thing, and kind of like a little bit of why, not too, not too brainy, and things, simple things that we can teach the family to do. One of the big question is when they stop eating and drinking. Um, that's a big question that happens and very concerning for families because eating and drinking is how we show our love. It's how we care. And when we can't feed and you know, give hot tea or whatever it is that, you know, to show our love for somebody, this, these families are going to be desperate. And sometimes what we can do is teach them other ways to care. And so then they're not so focused on the fact that mom's not eating or mom's not drinking. And also just, you know, lightly, um, you know, moisturizing the lips, the eyes and things like that. Um, I think that's it. Thanks, Adrian. You know, Don, I'm feeling a whole lot of gratitude right now. You know, I don't pretend to be a medical person. I focus in on the emotional, mental, and spiritual, um, but I really enjoy sitting at your feet and learning today. You um, have a wealth of knowledge and you share it very well. And so I, I really do thank you for that. Um, thank you. So uh, Susan takes her, her last breath. It was decided that we weren't going to call the hospice nurse right away to announce her death. Now, you have to understand that um, the, the, the hospice nurse is the one who pronounces the death. And so if you, if a family really wants to know the exact time or maybe legal matters or something like that, you want the hospice nurse right there. If it doesn't matter to the family, you know, it's such a sacred time. Sometimes we hold off calling hospice. Um, so, uh, the hospice nurse survives to announce Susan's death and save for about an hour supporting the family. Donna, do you want to share what you all do when you do show up? Mm -hmm. So normally it's a, it's a nurse and the home health aide. Um, sometime, depending on uh, close relationships, the social worker or the spiritual um, counselor that's on the case could be there too. But normally it's the nurse and the, and the home health aide. So as Adrian was talking about, as far as the pronouncement, the nurse does do the pronouncement and that the timing of a pronouncement is when that nurse assesses and determines death. So even if that patient has died and the family can attest to, you know, they died at 515, what the number that goes on the death certificate is when the, the nurse actually assesses the death. So sometimes that can, you know, be a contention, but, um, there's also a section on the death certificate that can say, you know, that can differentiate the two, but it's very important that the family, you know, just know that that's, that's the actual death certificate time of death. Um, so when they come in, they come in and um, that's their primary um, goal is, is to do that death certificate, but also to help you know, navigate calling the, calling the funeral home if the patient's going to a funeral home, helping that, and then supporting the family. So when the when the, the patient has passed, the concentration goes on to that family and reminding them about grief services and reminding them about grief. And that hospice doesn't disappear just because the patient has passed on. So, you know, hospice, even for people that are not on hospice, they can get bereavement services through, through, through hospice agencies. And we're there for that family um, at a minimum for a year afterwards. Um, so that's an important part because um, they're going to need the help. Re grieving is not like that. <laughs> it, it takes a while to kind of negotiate what life is going to be like without this loved one in their life. Um, the home health aides are there to help with postmortem care. Um, which usually happens, and we prepare the body for when the funeral comes, funeral home comes. Thanks again. Oh, so, you're very welcome. Because we waited some time before the hospice nurse came, and even before we called the funeral home, um, I opened the windows to slow down the physical changes of Susan's body. The immediate family members continue to sing songs, say prayers, read Bible verses and poems, and wept in that separate room that we set up <laughs> um, for Susan's request. And the woman did uh, bathe Susan. She wanted to be clean. She wanted to be in a dress. Um, and it's really important to know that, um, you know, as a paid professional supporting the family, I, I cannot necessarily help with the washing of the body. I can only, the only way I can do that is if the next of kin asked me to help 
and I come off the clock. I cannot get paid to touch the body once the last breath has been taken, because if I do, then I'm acting like a funeral director. So it really is the, the family's responsibility, the next of kin's responsibility um, for, the, uh, for the body. Um, the power of attorney is no longer in effect. Um, but so the women did choose to give Susan a bath. Um, and remember, we, we already rehearsed this. They were already prepared for this. And so really one of the, the goals of the doula is to equip their family member where they can take a step back, where you don't need to, to help or to show them how to turn the body or, or any of that because that was already practiced. Videos were already uh, viewed on how, how to make that happen. And so extended family members um, with their masks had a chance to stop by and say their goodbyes. The funeral home actually came hours later. Um, and the doula walked the body out with the funeral home reading Psalm 23, which is Susan's um, favorite Psalm. And so in honor of her story and in memory of Susan, I'm just gonna read Psalm 23, which is what I read as I walked out with the body with a couple of the gentlemen following the casket. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we're walking out with that casket. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So again, we're looking at patient-centered care. Our goal here was to show you how we come together as a team to support Susan, who's in the middle, to support her husband, her children, her friends and extended family, and her church members, where she was involved in the church. Death does not have to be feared. It is not and does not need to be a medical event. Death is simply as natural as birth. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Um, you know, that was, that was absolutely amazing. I am um, moved. <laughs> and I will tell you, I thought I knew a lot about, you know, dying symptoms and dying patients, and there's always something to be learned. I, um, yeah, amazing, absolutely amazing. And I hope you all enjoyed this. It was, um, you know, the information that you guys shared is, is priceless. Um, just kind of making these differentiations and, and uh, you know, you got to touch my heart. <laughs> So thank you so much for this. I hope you all enjoyed um, the song, the dying exercise. And um, hopefully, you know, this information will prove to be powerful in your life as well as your clinical practice. And now let us announce our winner of the raffle. I picked Carrie O'Keefe Owens out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized the light is off. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see me. <laughs> yeah, that's better. The sun was out when we started. <laughs> oh, so Carrie O'Keefe Owens, congratulations. You get one year membership to our chapter. And, um, you know, if you guys have any comments, you can put them in the chat. Oh, there she is. Hey, Carrie. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Congratulations. Any, any questions as well, Leslie, if they have any questions. Sure, sure. Um, 
Yeah, anybody want to raise their hand, use the hand feature? So there's there's 21 of us. I think we can we can handle some hands. While they're raising their hands, I did post two things in the chat. Um, kind of my little breakdown of non-distressing symptoms is in there and then something mm -hmm. from the HPNA. Okay, beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. I see Marilyn's comments uh, in the chat. One suggestion I would like to, to suggest is to make the comparison about dying. I tell them that when a child is born, it is joyful and a one-time event. Dying is the same, that it is a one-time event and it is all about the dying patient and they deserve to die the way they want and everyone should get on board with this. Of course, I share this delicately. <laughs> <laughs> nice, I love that, I love that, yeah. You know, I say to, to patients and, and healthcare providers, um, and families that, well, mostly to my colleagues that for us, it's, it's an every day dealing with patients that are dying, but for the patient and the family, this is their first time, you know, this is their first time. So we have to be gentle with them. Um, we can't expect them to be where we are in the process. So I, I really like that. Um, how do you pick a doula? How do you find a doula? And what is the cost of a doula? Well, let Adrian, me you want to take that? Well, um, I'll put my information in the chat for starters. So <laughs> seriously, um, you know, one of the things that I found recently um, is that I don't always have to make house visits. Like I was so nervous of meeting people and doing some of this work via Zoom, but sometimes they're not up to a visit. And so I'm finding that I'm able to reach more people virtually and possibly go in towards the very end for the vigil sitting. There is a, a national, um, we have a national alliance, national education doula alliance. And, and there's a directory you put in your uh, zip code or your state and it will take you to a list. Um, uh, unfortunately, doula is, doulas do get paid privately. So there's no insurance. Some of the very, very, very old, which barely exist anymore, policies make that gives you uh, a daily rate or a, a rate per, uh, I'm talking as far as like uh, long-term care insurance is concerned. It's very rare, some of the old policies, you can get a doula covered under that, but they no longer make those policies. Um, and as far as the cost of a doula, it really ranges um, for, for the doula. And, and how do you find one? You, li you listen to the moment. You know, I attract a certain um, type of patient, um, a, a certain family. I think that you, everyone is not for me and I'm not for everyone. Um, so I just think you listen to your heart space and you see, you have that initial call and you see if they're speaking your language. But it, it really can range. It could range from, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't, you know, maybe when you're starting out, maybe someone's charging $25 an hour, all the way up to like maybe 125. Some people charge more than that. Um, but it really is a range depending on their experience and what they're able to offer. Um, I, I know that the young lady, which I, I can't see her name. I'm also a, a Reiki practitioner. So I bring some healing techniques. I use crystals and oils and and all the good stuff that was mentioned earlier. So, so my rate is a little higher because I have special skills that I bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it depends on the family's need as well. Um, you know, some families probably and patients probably need more than others. Yeah. Um, Summer, I see your question. You, I'm sorry. sorry, usually doulas also do have a sliding scale. That's mm -hmm. one of the things that we're taught and we really preach that from all of our organizations that we're a part of. They have mm -hmm. a sliding scale so that way it's not always the haves and the have nots, right? Right, right. Yes, I um, I hear you, definitely. Um, and Summer, you asked a question, you know, um, Adrian kind of answered it, but basically you're asking, um, you know, you're saying this patient seems like they, you know, she had extraordinary financial resources. Mm -hmm. And are the geriatric case managers and doulas paid by insurance? And so, um, you know, Adrian, you pretty much answered that. I don't know about the geriatric yeah, um, you know, care yeah, managers, though. Yeah, they're, they're more likely to get paid by um, 
long-term care policy. Um, mm -hmm. do regard. Right. There are some policies mm -hmm. that cover a certain amount of hours for geriatric care managers. So they're mm -hmm. more likely to get paid by long-term care um, com insurance companies than a doula is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Does anybody see any other questions? Uh, what kind of training does a uh, does a doula? Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can okay. nurses be doulas? Yeah. So so uh, it's really interesting because I um I went through a um an online program eighteen months, so it included online um, real time classes. Again, this was uh well, this was actually I I started in two thousand seventeen, so this is well before we even online classes. And then I also was a hospice volunteer um, for two local hospice. And so one actually sent me on their dime to another 18 month program. So I'm actually dual certified. Um, <laughs> so, so there are online programs and, and you can find those programs on the NIDA website too. Just be really careful because there have been a lot of trainers who have popped up who have not spent any time in the, in the life you know, it, you know, having any experience, but they can write a good curriculum mm. because of COVID. And so just be really careful and make sure that your, your trainer speaks to you and speaks to your language and don't get caught up in, in the sales pitch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank um, you. So, so there are some nurse doulas. And mm -hmm. what I say to that and what's my understanding is, is that again, I'm talking about certifications, with, which means that I went through a program and someone said, you passed the program. There was hands-on experience. I had to have, I was already a hospice volunteer. Um, you have to have a certain amount of hours before you can get certified um, working with, at the end of life. Um, I believe, um, it's my understanding that when you show up as a nurse doula, that your license supersedes your um, certification. So just be really careful that, um, that your license, your, the highest license you have supersedes the lower ones. Thanks, Adrian. I see Glenda asked, can you provide a list of the sibling harmony techniques? Sure, I'll put that in the chat right now. Okay, great. Thank you. And let's see. Okay, Sammy is saying, as a social worker, um, it was appreciated the case example, including how others in the care team can aid in the management and assistance to patients and their families. It's clear to me that there's a lot of power in how we synchronize our expertise to the complexity of end of life care. Thank you for this training. Yeah, that's great that we are able to, I think our chapter does a really good job at incorporating all of the members of the, um, you know, the end of life care team. Um, I think a lot of our programs have definitely um, made that emphasis. So I appreciate that comment. Let's see, any other questions? Um, okay, you answered the, what kind of training do you have? I don't see any hands. Does anyone have any other questions, comments? Oh, here's a hand, Marilyn, go for it. What? You're muted. I want to share over many years, 30 years plus of doing this, the one thing that's rarely mentioned is the spiritual uh, component that when patients are dying, they reach out in the room uh, uh, for their loved ones and actually see their deceased loved ones in the room. And I'm going to go as far as to see, say angels. Mm -hmm. And this has been reported in many, many cultures. And I have experienced it. There's lots of documents, people dying with the tunnel coming back. And we need to acknowledge mm -hmm. that the dying is, uh, you know, spiritual, mystical, and this often reaching out and feeling the presence and that peace before they die, that their loved ones are present. I mean, I swear to God, I have seen angels come and go. I see them around hospitals. You know, there've been movies about angels that appeared with that love story with uh, Megan, what's her name? The actress that, you know, falls in love with an angel. I have seen angels get into an elevator or the doors open, something happens in the clothes. I have seen angels on the 
in the areas around me of the morgue or the dying and I turn around and they disappear. There's no, it's mystical. I love it. There is no way I'm going to prove this, but, the, but there is a lot of report, uh, reportage, as they say, about this uh, for centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, and all, whether you're a Buddhist, Hindu, you know, Muslim, Catholic, Christian, this is reported over and over again about the angels and the loved ones being present. And to me, it's one of the most mystical, mystical gifts of when one is dying. So I would like to hear from any others of you that have experienced this like I have or have read about this. So I absolutely and I'm putting I'm putting something in the chat right now. So let me just spell it right bit. There's a book called Visions, Trips, and Crowded Rooms. I think I spelled it right. Um, it is, it's in a beautiful account of all near-death awarenesses. Um, you, you, you can't put it down. You're, you're going to read it from cover to cover. Um, and one of the other things in, in, in terms of what I call those non-distressing symptoms is these near-death awarenesses. And these these withdrawing statements where I'm going to go on a trip or I need my, my wedding dress or, you know, people, they, we see it time and time again. And yeah, there's some medical, uh, explanations. There's no, you know, hypoxia, there's no oxygen to the brain, but when you are there, when that happens, mm -hmm. it's, it's an unmistakable feeling that you feel. And I'm going to use the word soul because it's just, it's a, it's one of those things that you sense and you feel, and, and you can't use your brain to explain things like that. It's just something that you just know. So I would have to agree with that as well. Um, what I'm really careful for as a doula is to come in with no expectations. And so um, I've seen it, I've experienced it, you know, I, I work with energy, I can feel it. Um, I can see the change when, when, um, the family members, deceased family members or loved ones show up and the person who is closer to the end of life. Um, I, I will also say that um, lately I told you that I, I you know, you attract the, the people that mm -hmm. you're supposed to serve. And one of the gifts that I've been given lately is that, and these seem to be the um, people that I've been attracting is that some people are given the gift right. of having more of a say so of when they take the last breath than I think science and medicine can explain. And so is it the will? I, I don't know exactly what it is, but there are some people who are given the gift. And I, I believe my mother was given that gift. Um, she didn't have to make her hard decisions. She, <coughs> she did all the work that I charged people for. She did, I guess she said, Adrian is not going to come over here and mess with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I'm definitely the outsider doing end of life work. And she did it. And, and she was able to, I believe that she had a part in when she, she took her last breath. And those are some of the people that I'm attracting now, that they're not going through all of the stages that we discussed today. And so each, each step is, is, is unique. Um, so, so I do agree that, um, you know, loved ones come and greet um, people. So some people are given that gift as well. I would have to say that I experienced a lot of gifts as well working at a hospice residence um, because you know the patients were there for months at a time. We could really uh, develop relationships with them. And when they got closer to um, dying, I, as um, Donna had said, you know, they are starting to get more agitated. They're trying to get out of bed. They're pulling things off. They want to go somewhere. Where are you going? I have to get my suitcase. It's time to go. So they use a lot of the language that are very symbolic. Um, and then working um, in GIP settings, you know, where the family is sitting vigil and we're all wondering, oh, today, maybe she's going to die. Well, she's still alive. What is she waiting for? What is she waiting for? And oftentimes it's just a phone call to someone that they're waiting to hear from. So we ask, is there someone that has been come to visit that maybe she would want to, you know, do some end, end, of, end business. And we'll call that relative, like say in Puerto Rico, who could not come to visit to say their goodbye. And we're just holding the phone up to their ear and then 
within the next couple of hours, they die. All, over and over and over again, I've experienced that. And I, I also agree, Marilyn, that it is a very spiritual experience. You feel it. You can feel the people in the room. And it's just an amazing, like uh, Donna referred, it's like your soul. And so I appreciate everyone sharing and validating, um, you know, mm -hmm. this experience at the end. Yes. I'd yeah. like to suggest that all of you who have not done this to go to a morgue and sit there. But I also hang out at cemeteries. Everywhere I travel, I go to cemeteries. I sit there and I have conversations with everyone in the cemetery. I'm happier in a cemetery than I am often with people alive. And it is fabulous. I mean, call me crazy, but I, I just know. I just know that there is a, something. Else. And I've gone to moments that I don't believe in God, too much trauma nursing, you know, blah, 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 death, war, and all that. But I always come back that I know there's entities that we do not disappear there's too much literature and thousands of years are reporting on this that i highly recommend that you try that you try this and 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 do some you know meditation go there sit i'm not afraid of dying frankly i'm afraid of living especially to <laughs> if i don't have enough in my in my 401k to get to 100 <laughs> I can't wait to die. I, I can't wait. And also, I suggest that in despair and when you struggle as a hospice nurse, call in your ancestors. Get in your space, in a room, light a candle, incense, whatever, a crystal on your chakra site. Call in your ancestors to support you, your mother, your favorite aunt. You will be stunned at what happens. Thank you so much for that. Um... I know we're a little bit over our time, um, but um, you know I think this was absolutely amazing. And if you will just indulge me for for one minute, so you know, Tacy, what you're saying is so real. Um, I think what struck me why I was almost crying <laughs> when you guys finished your presentation was it made me think of my grandmother and how you know she was home on hospice, my husband and I were taking care of her and day in and day out. I mean, it was very short. I mean, she was walking, talking, you know, then within eight days she died. Um, but she waited for my friends who we were estranged and I just happened to call her and I said, and she and my grandmother were very close and she came over and within, you know, a half an hour, my grandmother died. And I was like, Oh, my goodness, she was waiting for her, <laughs> you know, so I, I and we see it all the time. So it just really, this has been so amazing for, for me, you know, personally, so I want to thank you guys so much. Um, and I want to thank you all for being here. Um, if anybody, you know, wants to contact us, you can contact us on nursing network, um does anybody else have anything to share no all right well thank you guys so much and um 